Welcome to the Circular Economy Show from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. I'm Colin Webster and I'm here with my colleague, Pippa Sholly. Hi, Colin. And if you've been listening to this series so far, you know that we're looking at the things that inspired the circular economy, the schools of thought. So we've already talked about cradle to cradle, biomimicry and regenerative design. And today we're talking about... An idea called industrial symbiosis. And once we've talked about that, we'll talk about how that fits in with the circular economy. Okay. And so who have you been out to speak to for this? Two great guests today. Later on, we'll hear from Radu Godina. He's an associate professor at the Nova School of Science and Technology. But first, we're going to hear from Lisbeth Randers, who is the symbiosis facilitator at Kallenborg. Now, Kallenborg is an industrial park in Denmark, which that's not a new thing, right, Colin? No, it's, it's like the world famous example of industrial symbiosis in action. You went right to the centre of the experts. If you're going to go for it, you go all the way. Yep, that's right. So I started by asking Elizabeth what her role is at the park. So what I do in my daily job is to facilitate and to develop new symbiosis uh, projects together with the partners in the symbiosis uh, and at least together with my three good colleagues uh, in the office of uh, the symbiosis so what, what does that mean then? Symbiosis will be a new phrase for some listeners here. Tell us exactly what that means. Well, symbiosis is taken from biology when uh, you have two species uh, benefiting from uh, living closely together. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, birds and bees, you could say that's uh, one of the best examples. Uh, uh, they benefit from having this uh, collaboration and it's exactly the same. A sort of metaphor that, uh, that we use when we're talking about industrial uh, symbiosis because when we have different partners, uh, they can share their residue uh, so that you can actually turn a, a side stream uh, or a residue in one company uh, into a resource or into a commodity in another company. So being located in the same area, uh, in a local cluster, uh, you can have this dialogue. Uh, how can we use the resources uh, better? How can we uh, maybe also uh, create mutual infrastructure so that resources are, are used in different uh, qualities uh, among different partners? So it's actually all about uh, sort of reaching out uh, to your neighbours, uh, looking for new partners uh, that you can uh, uh, cooperate with. So for those of us that haven't been to Kallenborg, what does it look like? Well, I mean, I've not been either, Pippa. My travel budget doesn't extend to that, sadly. Um, but I did ask Lisbeth to explain. Uh, yeah, you would see uh, an industrial cluster uh, sort of integrated in the local community. Uh, and the most visual sign of uh, that there's actually something special going on here in Kallenborg uh, are the uh, steam pipes that you can see running from the power station to the companies uh, at the other end of the industrial uh, cluster. Um, they provide uh, the energy uh, and sort of connects uh, the power station and the companies. And we use uh, those pipes in our logo because we think that they are a good metaphor for, for, for the exchange that is actually taking place in Kalambor. But we have many other different uh, exchanges and some of them you can see visually uh, in the landscape as pipelines or transportation belts uh, uh, or uh, materials being transported uh, in trucks. Uh, some of them are bilateral agreements, uh, uh, commercial agreements that you cannot actually see in the landscape. Uh, but if you talk to the companies and you uh, ask them to tell uh, how they treat their side streams, uh, you will hear them tell this story about how they cooperate with the local partners in the area. And in order to be a member of the industrial part, do you have to offer something or take something from another member? For our core members, uh, that is the criteria that they have to uh, be willing uh, or able to share a, a stream uh, with the others, uh, with the other partners in the symbiosis. But uh, we have also started working with associated members that can either pro provide uh, service solutions, uh, new technologies, or uh, or uh, other kind of um, uh, su support uh, functions uh, to the existing uh, partners in the symbiosis. And we uh, have seen that that is quite interesting for local uh, suppliers uh, to be a part of the symbiosis and to enter this uh, world of collaboration. So a couple of times Lisbeth mentioned the word collaboration when she was telling me about what goes on at Kallenborg and I wanted to ask her a little bit more about how these exchanges actually take place. 
we have today uh, more than 30 streams running between the companies. So I think that's quite a large number of uh, exchanges. And it all expresses uh, collaboration on different levels because in order to shape a symbiotic project, uh, you must have uh, collaboration not uh, only on uh, on handling uh, the, the physical stream, but you, must all, you, you also have to collaborate on shaping uh, the legal frames, the economical uh, frames around this project. So we see collaboration take place in very many different areas uh, because creating a symbiotic uh, collaboration is is quite complex and involves also uh, that you look uh, that you look on your uh, um, uh, supply um, uh, security uh, that if this uh, if this stream uh, will uh, someday um, terminate what is your plan b how can you uh, sort of allow your partners uh, to um, uh, to be timely um, warned about this uh, termination and uh, things like that it, it requires a capacity a local capacity uh, to design those uh, uh, agreements okay this is something i've been wondering what happens when these waste streams run out Does, is there some way of it evolving over time yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess so. That was my thought too. Um, and what Elizabeth told me was that the park was first established in the 1970s when there was a gas refinery. It had excess energy mm-hmm. uh, that it was simply burning out. And across the road, there was a plasterboard company who was setting up a new facility. And of course, it was in need of an energy supply. Right. And these days, gas doesn't seem very circular, but I guess at the time, it was just making the most of what was being wasted. Yeah, I think so. I think it was just a smart use of available resources um, to benefit two different companies. But the thing about this park is, although it started in the 1970s, it didn't actually get any widespread attention until the 1990s, when a very lovely thing happened. But let me let Lisbeth tell you this one. Uh, so, uh, to start with the beginning, um, there was uh, this uh, uh, sustainability uh, report made by Gro Harlem uh, uh, Brundtland, and that was the inspiration of a feature week at the local high school. So, they were doing all kinds of different projects uh, at uh, the high school there, uh, and among them uh, was a group of, st- of uh, students that were out interviewing uh, the companies, uh, what were they doing with their waste fraction, how could they actually tap into this uh, sustainability difference. And they started to uncover uh, all these um, collaboration agreements that existed uh, between the companies. Uh, and and they created an awareness among uh, the site managers that, whoa, this is actually something special. We have a kind of ecosystem. And they built a small model uh, of that uh, ecosystem. And there was an, um, sort of a, a symposium at the, at, at the high school at the end of the feature week where they invited the site managers of the big companies in the area and and, and they invented this um, uh, definition of uh, uh, symbiosis, and they, they named it. They named it uh, industrial symbiosis, taking the biological uh, term um, uh, where two species benefit from uh, a close uh, collaboration. Uh, and and there was a local newspaper at the symposium uh, writing about the uh, the symbiosis, the, the new industrial symbiosis uh, being detected by this group of uh, high school students. Uh, and after that, there was a, uh, an article in a national paper. And um, uh, after that, a finance, Financial Times uh, came to Calumbo and wrote an article about what was actually going on. And from there, it spread into sort of a, a textbook, textbook examples of industrial ecology. And it was uh, beca- becoming a, a kind of a best practice example of how you can actually uh, set up a, a, an industrial ecosystem uh, in a local um, uh, community. Uh, we celebrated our 50 years anniversary uh, back in 2022. Uh, and uh, we were lucky enough to have a visit from one of these uh, students from uh, 1989 that actually uh, was out there interviewing and detecting the symbiosis. And that was such a highlight for me uh, to hear uh, her t- uh, talking about uh, this uh, this work that they did uh, at that time. They, they won a, a prize, a national prize also for the work. There are so many lovely aspects to that story, Colin, starting with how this all emerged organically between local businesses, then engaging young people in the story and, and actually giving some sort of 
um, power to those students to point this out, the engagement of the local press, the storytelling aspect of it, and then it going international. Mm. And now it's the textbook example. Totally agree. And I don't, do you know this, Pippa? I used to be a high school teacher. I did. Oh, well, I probably <laughs> bored you with that story before. <laughs> but um, so I think that's part of the reason why I really like this tale um, is because of the high school students involved in it. And also, I think what this tale tells us too is is the power of sensible business, yeah. right? That It sounds like the businesses in Kallenborg didn't feel the need to shout about what they were doing, perhaps didn't even know what they were doing was special. That just made sense to them to, to work the way that they worked. Yeah, it made good business sense. Yes, but Elizabeth, what she did say to me in part of the conversation that we had was the, the real need to keep telling these stories though. Mm. Um, so that the spotlight is forever on the opportunities that industrial symbiosis offers. And that's part of her day-to-day -day operations. Um, and part of that tale, of course, is the financial benefit, which we haven't talked about yet. But indeed, we get into that just now as Elizabeth answers my question about finance. I think the financial incentive is very important. Um, and it has been also uh, part of the sustainable um, duration of the of the symbiosis, uh, it, it it doesn't depend on uh, public substitutes or uh, or whatever, because it's 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 good business uh, and it's um, it's a good business case when you can save money, uh, not um, uh, getting rid of your waste uh, uh, as a landfill uh, material, but that you can um, give it away or maybe sell it uh, for a, a, a small sum of money to to the neighbor company you can save money on your uh, on on transporting uh, waste fractions uh, uh, things like that so there's definitely an economic insensitive but i think also today uh, the environmental uh, bottom line you could say that uh, the green profiles of the companies uh, is uh, also a part of the business case today so if if a company you can see this is a, this is a good uh, investment uh, in the long term, but also uh, environmental uh, protection, uh, pr protection of biodiversity, protection of local resources uh, uh, plays uh, play a more and more uh, important role in uh, defining the business case. So there's that business case there. There's the environmental benefits and the social benefits. It sounds like a win-win-win situation, but is that too good to be true? No, no. I, I mean, it, on the face of it, it definitely does sound like that. But of course, the practice isn't widespread, which mm. raises the question as always, why? So I did ask our, my next guest, Radu, about the barriers to adopting industrial symbiosis. Um, but before we hear him, what do you think he might say the barriers are? Okay, so I think we've talked about Kallenborg having that natural occurrence. So maybe it's that you don't have those businesses next door to each other. Lisbeth also talked about the need to keep reinforcing that storytelling to know that it's a thing. And I guess there's also something around regulation probably because if you have all these diff different in industries doing different things, they probably have different regulations that they need to conform to. I think that's a top answer. Thank you. As we will hear in just a minute here from Radu Gadina. So to remind people, Radu is the Associate Professor at Nova School of Science and Technology, and he is a researcher into industrial symbiosis. Let's hear from Radu about what Pippa got right there. Because there are many barriers to the, to the realisation, let's say, let's call it to the realisation of of potential of industrial symbiosis. So there are, in, in my studies, we have found ideal locations of uh, industrial parks that could, be, could have benefited from industrial symbiosis from a long time. The potential of industrial symbiosis there is quite high, but it wasn't implemented yet. And that has to do with, because of many reasons. Um, there are several studies that point out the lack of appropriate policies, uh, and that is a, is a barrier to the application of these practices. Uh, for example, low taxes on landfill disposal is one of them. Um, lack of policies that encourage on regulate industrial symbiosis. Lack of funds to promote this practice. And deficient uh, regulatory framework 
Another barrier is the reluctance of companies to establish this um, kind of relationship, uh, not only due to a lack of knowledge of the industrial symbiosis mechanism, but also due to lack of knowledge of other companies with the potential of receive or provide waste. Lack of trust has been, has been um, documented several times. Colin, did he explain what he meant by lack of trust? Yeah, he did. That was interesting. He said that even though two companies who could share resources might not compete with each other, there is a general reluctance to share detailed information about their processes um, because that came from a place that maybe they would be careless with the information that they've been given. Sounds like quite a psychological issue, which I guess we don't often think about in business. But I wonder if there are certain places where that plays out more than others. Yeah, it was exactly my thought that maybe certain societies would be more accepting, embracing of the idea of industrial symbiosis. So indeed, I put that question to Radu. I would say that yes, um, the, also the environment that surrounds you also incentivizes you to do it. The willingness of people to share in the North and the South vary a lot. So in the South, people tend to become more individualistic. Trust in, 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 in social democracy is lower. And, um, and in Northern countries and Scandinavian countries is much higher. So what is the, the underlying idea of social democracy is sharing. And when Radu talks about Scandinavia there, I guess it makes sense that this textbook example of Kallenborg is in Denmark, which is in Scandinavia. Yeah, absolutely. Um, But the reality is of industrial symbiosis, there are more examples of this in China than anywhere else in the world. And what Radu went on to express was that the examples of Kallenborg and others in Northern Europe were were uh, an example of a bottom-up approach, Mm -hmm. whereas what we're seeing in China is a top-down approach. And does it matter if it happens from the government pushing it down or from bottom-up? Well, I mean, I would have have thought it's fine um, if it happens either way, if it's a good thing. And Radu said as much, but what he did have was some reservations about whether or not a top-down approach could be long-lasting. Uh, or even if it would be optimal if those who are implementing industrial symbiosis maybe didn't truly believe in it. Mm, because if it emerges sort of organically, like we talked about at Kallenborg, um, you have that sort of collaborative creativeness that sort of um, keeps you inspired to keep working on it. Whereas if it comes from the government you're, and you're being told to do it, you need the carrot and the stick. And And to reflect on some other things that we've talked about actually in this series... Um, the mindset change isn't necessarily there, I guess, if it's a top-down approach, right? Yeah. Um, changing the way that people think changes their behaviours for the better, one, one would hope. And I think sometimes you can think that policy is going to be the magic one that fixes everything, but that is that top-down approach. Mm. So they need to complement one another. I think so. But whether it's um, bottom-up or top-down, to go back to Elizabeth, she realises the power of leadership in making all of this happen. Because I think uh, also very important for for the Kalimbos symbiosis is that uh, that the leading companies uh, has sort of um, shown the courage uh, to say we believe in this way of uh, working together uh, that that might not uh, be the most uh, obvious way uh, to create uh, partnerships or or to create uh, this. Uh, green transition, but we believe in partnerships and we sort of um, invest in them in a local setup. Um, uh, We think that we must um, allocate resources uh, to cooperate uh, in the local uh, community. And I think taking that kind of of leadership uh, and uh, responsibility, uh, that is so important. And I think we will never reach circular economy uh, and, uh, and and achieve more industrial symbiosis uh, anywhere in the world if we do not have leaders that are willing to take that uh, responsibility, to, to take that risk also uh, of failing, of not uh, succeeding and not having this uh, uh, partnership uh, that attracts attention. That's so important, isn't it? That 
idea that it's safe to take risks because that's it's on the other side of those risks that you have innovation. Yeah, yeah, we hear that time and time again from people on this podcast. Um, but also, I think what we also hear on this podcast is this idea of the need to tell good stories. And that really came through, especially in what Elizabeth said, but in, in some cases what Radu was saying too. I think that reinforces why it's worth taking those risks as well, because you need to hear these success stories from other places to feel comfortable attempting to try something in your environment. Right. And that's why we have the Circle Economy Show. It is. So we have talked today about industrial symbiosis, but where does that fit in with the circular economy? Well, I think there's clear connections we can all see, right? It's about um, resources staying Mm -hmm. within the system. Um, It's about collaboration um, across the system because we we think that um, in order for a circular economy to work successfully, you need to have much higher levels of collaboration than we have today because take, make, waste, um, you wave goodbye to your resources whereas we want to keep them in the system through various actors. So sharing resources... Um, there's there's waste reduction, of course, is a key part of what they're talking about in industrial symbiosis. And also, you see a lot of the living systems metaphor within industrial symbiosis too. It works like a living system, in inverted commas, um, because it's about that flow of resources. Yeah. I guess one of the differences is that the industrial symbiosis examples that we've heard about today have happened almost by accident, whereas in a circular economy, we talk about setting up a system that's all through design. So it's an intentional from the outset. Yeah, I, I don't know how representative um, the Kallenberg uh, um, origin story is of industrial symbiosis across the park. Mm. Um, but but I guess what I pick up more than anything is that the industrial symbiosis is business to business, whereas circular economy needs to, to be both. Um, and, and perhaps there isn't an elimination of waste at the heart of what's going on within industrial symbiosis yeah. through design. Um, you're, you're seeing a clever use of a waste resource rather than th- than asking ourselves how we can design it out so it never exists in the first place. It's a sort of upcycling piece rather than eliminating piece. I think that's a good way of putting it, yeah. Okay, so thank you for bringing the industrial symbiosis chat today, Colin. What are we talking about next time? Well, next time is the last in this series where we will look at the performance economy. Great. So if you've enjoyed the show, then please share it with everyone who you think would be interested and join us next week on the Circular Economy Show. And make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss an episode. See you next time. Goodbye for now.